Um, I asked them where they're going in New Orleans, and I said, how many women here are going to walk down Bourbon Street and flash? One woman who's about 70 said, I plan to. <laughs> and then some other guy yelled, I'm going to strip joint. So these two people are talking to each other. One's up there and one's down there, and everybody's talking to each other, and we finally got the talk going, but I you know, basically said, Okay, we got to start, and we'll talk about social life afterwards. But we had a good time with that one. That's me and Phil Sims. That is back in 1982, 1983. Uh, Phil, the Giants quarterback, who was an MVP of the Super Bowl, and me. And Phil looks like he was more interested in eating his banana than spending right, time right, with right. me. And we have, over the years, discussed his like of bananas and his dislike of actually, nah, that's not true. Phil and okay. I get along rather well. Uh, so anyway, that's Phil. That's Pace University. And uh, we were um, discussing whatever we were discussing for the 1982 football season. Um, the Super Bowl, how many of you are going to parties this weekend? No one. No one. Nobody's going. How many of you have gone to parties in the past? Okay, and how many of you have been the host of parties in the past? Oh, I feel sorry for you. Who cleaned up? Who cleaned up? My husband said I'm yeah. never going to a Super Bowl party again because yeah. I can't watch the Super Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, but it is America's excuse to throw a mid-winter weekend party. Now, Super Bowl. This is how the Super Bowl came about. An act of Congress. An act of Congress okay. created the Super Bowl. Super Bowl was created after the United States Congress passed legislation allowing the merger of the American Football League and the National Football League. Now, the merger was tacked on to an anti-inflation bill. What politician in his right mind or her right mind is going to say, yeah, let's vote for inflation? <laughs> So anyway, uh, this was put on a bill that they knew that was nearly unanimously going to be passed, signed into law by President Lyndon Johnson on November 8, 1966. Now, you might be wondering about security of the Super Bowl because whether you like it or not, you're all paying for it. The NFL is not paying for it. Uh, there have been people on the ground since uh, for the last year and a half in Las Vegas for the Super Bowl, making sure that no stone, no stone is left unturned in terms of securing this. Uh, the NFL and the security people start working on, their, they've been working on the 2025 Super Bowl now for about six months just to make sure it's secure. Now, uh, this is a major, major security event. In fact, there are only two bigger events. One, the presidential inaugural, which is every four years. The other, the state of the presidential state of the union address, where everybody is there except one cabinet member in case somebody decides to blow up Capitol Hill. Um, so that is more secure than the Super Bowl and the presidential inaugural. Uh, the Super Bowl is a special events assessment rating level number one. There are 50 agencies who have been working for the last year and a half uh, to make sure that the event is totally secure. There is no word on how much money it costs to secure the Super Bowl, but you're paying for it, I'm paying for it. NFL, they don't even stick their hand in their pocket to offer a dime. It's all on the government's dime. Uh, FEMA, FBI, TSA, Customs and Border Patrol, Local police in uh, Las Vegas this year, local police, probably Clark County uh, police, along with uh, Nevada State Troopers, all involved, all part of the security uh, team. The uh, Super Bowl comes out of the Civil Rights Movement. Now, you might be asking me, how do you get the Super Bowl coming out of the Civil Rights Movement? But it is part of the civil rights movement, and here is how. These are a bunch of disgruntled football players. Um, that is uh, Butch Brewer, who played with Buffalo on the right, and that's Earl Faison, who played with San Diego. Curtis McClinton, who played with Kansas City. I'm not sure who is bending down with the glasses. But they're at the airport, and they're waiting for tickets to get out of New Orleans. The 
American Football League All-Star Game was supposed to be played in New Orleans, and New Orleans was supposed to get an American Football League team. But, this is the history. A quick background. How the Super Bowl came together. The Civil Rights Act of 1964, Jim Crow, New Orleans, a player's boycott, Senator Russell Long, Representative Hale Boggs, Cokie Roberts' father, if you remember Cokie Roberts, um, the representative from Brooklyn, Emanuel Seller, were all part of the Super Bowl creation by accident and design. So let's go back to uh, the Jim Crow South and this guy, Walter Beach. Uh, he was playing with the Boston Patriots in 1960 and 61, and he was fired by the uh, Boston Patriots owner, Billy Sullivan. He was labeled a troublemaker, and this is why he was a troublemaker. 1961, there's a game in New Orleans, a preseason game. The American Football League is testing out the market to see whether or not New Orleans could, uh, could support a professional football team. Well, Walter Beach is with uh, Boston, and he starts to talk to his uh, African-American teammates, and he says, hey, listen, why do we have to go down there? And when we get down there, we have to go on a separate bus. And we have to stay in a hotel on the other side of town. Why can, we're members of the Boston Patriots, all of us. And uh, Walter Beach would end up being a civil rights activist in Cleveland. Uh, why, why is this? Why is it? Well, it's just the custom. Uh, I had a friend, have a friend, Abner Haynes, who played with the Dallas Texans. Uh, and he was the captain of the Dallas Texans. And he was telling me one day, that uh, the Texans are on their charter and they fly into Fayetteville, Arkansas to play a game in 1961. The coach of the team is uh, my old buddy, Henry, Hank Stram. Oh. And um, Henry, Henry was uh, a little bit, uh, let's say a lot. You know that Henry was, uh, you got a Yankee shirt on. At Purdue University, Henry was the offensive coordinator. George Steinbrenner was his uh, offensive uh, running back coach. Yeah, so anyway. So Henry would go to Abner, he says, you know how it is, Abner would get on the bus with a couple of his teammates, uh, they couldn't stay together in Fayetteville, they went to the other side of the town, and that's just the way it was. And Walter Beach wanted to break that and said, hey, we're all members of the team, he ended up getting fired. He ended up with the championship Cleveland Browns team and uh, ended up uh, in Cleveland as a civil rights activist. Another civil rights activist is this guy right here in the middle, Al Davis, old AD. And it's his first year with the Oakland Raiders. And the Oakland Raiders are scheduled to play the New York Jets, Mobile, Alabama. And in that picture is the hammer, Freddie Williamson, Clement Daniels. Uh, the guy there on the, who's still alive remarkably, uh, is Jim Otto, the center, who uh, has somehow made it to 86 years old. I don't know how he has, but he has, amazingly enough. But anyway, Davis is in his first year as the coach of the Oakland Raiders, and there's a preseason a game scheduled between the Raiders and the newly named New York Jets with Sonny Whirlwind and Phil Isla. Hey, Jets fans here? Yay! Jay, 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 condolences. Long suffering. Long suffering. Condolences. It's been 50, 55 59, years now. Right? Yep. It's been 55 years. We'll talk about when, that. I was trying to tell a story yeah. that last year yeah. I was at a Dunkin' Donuts. Yeah. And basically, and the girl says to me, yeah. as you're going out, well, have a great day. Without thinking, I just said, I haven't had a great day since Nate was uh, <laughs> There you go. My son was at a game and he was in the, uh, what do you call it, uh, in the parking lot. Yeah. I suddenly saw the owner. He was greeting all the people. Oh, I guess oh, Woody. Yeah, Woody. Woody, 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 Woody. Anyway, so it's August 1963, and there were six African-American members of the Oakland Raiders, and they said, we're not playing. We're not playing. We just found out there's segregated seating. We are not playing. Mobile had hosted three American Football League preseason games in 1960, 61, and 62. Al Davis, actually, if you knew him, to some people he had a heart of gold. He'd give you the shirt off his back. But that's only a select number of people. Uh, he's a rookie coach with Oakland, and he supports his players. Clement Daniels, Art Powell, Bo Roberson, Freddie the Hammer Williamson, Proverb Jones, Eugene White. We're not playing. Al Davis said, we're not going. They stayed in Oakland. That game between uh, the Jets and the Raiders, 
played in Oakland. This is the stadium today in Mobile, Alabama. It is called the Lad Peebles Stadium. Um, and uh, Ray Schusler Jr. was the Lad Stadium manager in 1963. And he says, we don't want four boys from Oakland. This is the, just the, the thought right there, boys. We don't want four boys from Oakland to tell us how to run our stadium. Now we're going to integrate quietly. Now we're going to go ahead as in the past for other exhibition games here. Guess what? They never had another exhibition game there. Uh, Clement Daniels said, I wanted to play in Mobile before an integrated crowd and contribute in some small way to breaking down these needless prejudices. The game was played in Oakland. Uh, the AFL never returned to Mobile. Now, on Saturday, there was a game in Mobile, the Senior Bowl. But in 1965, the Senior Bowl, after the Civil Rights Act was passed, still didn't want to invite African-American players to play in their game. Uh, but the uh, Senior Bowl was integrated, although the organizers really, really were reluctant. So this brings us to New Orleans and the beginning of the Super Bowl in late 1964 and early 1965. And that's Cookie Gilchrist. He played with the Buffalo Bills. Uh, and he was one of 22 African-American All-Stars playing in the AFL All-Star Game in Tulane Stadium in New Orleans. And New Orleans was desperate. They wanted a team, and this is their opportunity. Uh, the New Orleans leaders, the civic leaders, politicians, business leaders said the city was going to welcome the AL, AFL All-Stars with 22 black players with open arms. Hey, segregation? Nah, no more. Jim Crow? Wow, that's gone because, you know, Johnson, Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act into law on July the 7th, 1964. So, you know what? Doesn't exist here anymore. And, yeah, we really do want a team. We really want a team. Well, the American Football League, and if you look at this program, forget about the coaches, uh, Henry, Hank Stram, and Pop Ivey, there are eight players on this program from San Diego in 1963. Three of them are African Americans and five of them are black players. That's 37.5%. The American Football League at the time was the only league to truly embrace African American athletes. They were equal to the white players on the uh, field. Now, how many of you watched the NFL Today on CBS back in the 1970s with my friend Irv Cross? Yeah. Irv Cross. About, uh, Irv passed away a couple years ago. So about four years ago, five years ago, uh, Irv and I, uh, he was in Minneapolis. Um, we're talking on the, uh, on the phone one day. And uh, Irv says, so uh, what you talking about? I said, I got to do the Super Bowl thing. So you're going to talk about New Orleans? I said, yeah, I'm going to talk about New Orleans. He said, hold on a second, hold on a second. I said, what, what's up? He said, let me think about this. Let me think about my rookie year with the Philadelphia Eagles. And let's see, there was me, and there was Ted Dean, and Clarence Peaks, and Tim Brown. The quota, you're going to talk about the quota? I said, I'm going to talk about the quota. Four African Americans per team in the NFL when he broke in in 1961. You do the counting. Uh, he said, it was aligned perfectly. Four of us, two rooms, that's all they needed. And those, that was it. In fact, it wasn't until 1962 that... Uh, the Washington team was forced to desegregate because they were using a uh, federal facility, D.C. Stadium, in the Kennedy administration. And um, Udell, the Secretary of the Interior, said, you either desegregate or we're kicking you out of the stadium. That's as late as 1962. The owner was George Preston Marshall, who would tell you that he was a racist. He had no problems with it. He also dated Louise Brooks Lulu, the silent film star of the 1920s. Well, the AFL, they needed players, so they went to, uh, they needed players, they went to the traditional black schools, Grambling and Bethune Cookman and Prairie View and North Carolina AT&T and Morgan State and Southern University and A&M College, while the NFL went to the traditional big-time schools to find players. Ironically, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 destroyed the black college football programs as the best players could attend the big schools, 
Alabama, Georgia, Tennessee, Mississippi, Mississippi State, Florida, Florida State, Miami, uh, Georgia, and all throughout the South. Now, would you mess with this guy? Yeah. Ernie Ladd. The big cat, the big cat right. six foot nine, three hundred twenty pounds. Would you, would you mess with him? He was a big time wrestler too. So, would you mess with this guy? Yes. You would mess with him. Okay. Players report to New Orleans, and they're told by the owners, by the owners of their team, name, rank, and serial number. That's it. Abner Haynes, running back, Kansas City Chiefs doing business as part of the American Football League All-Star Game. Don't say anything else. Just don't say anything else. There, but you're going to be welcome with open arms. Well, the players get to the airport, and they get the first bad sign. All the white players are being picked up by the Cavs. And all the black players are, why aren't they picking us up? Why aren't they picking us up? No, they're not picking them up. Cab after cab past Clement Daniels. White players zoomed off without having to wait. When a black player went to hop in with a white player, the cabbie could say, no can do, except for Jack Kemp, who was the president of the American Football League Players Association, who ran for president in 1979. And you're going to see a picture with me and him in 1979 in a minute. He took Gilchrist, and he told the cab driver, I'm responsible for him. If he does anything to the car, I'm responsible. Now think of this. Jack Kemp. Kemp was born in, what, 1936, this is 20, so he's 29, Cookie Gilchrist is about 30, and he's taking responsibility for him, for the cab. Uh, the cabs didn't come. Eventually, Kemp gets to the Hotel Roosevelt in New Orleans, there were two um, hotels, Roosevelt and Fountain Blue, where the players were there, and he gets a call from one of the players, we're still out here. Now, he's the Buffalo Bills quarterback. He's also the executive, he's also the president of the American Football League Players Association. And he calls Bud Adams, who's the owner of the Houston Oilers, and uh, he gets a hold of the governor, John McKeithen. It's McKeithen, according to this guy who told me yesterday, you don't know how to speak the local dialect. I said, no, I'm from New York. What do you expect? Anyway, McKeithen uh, says, um, let's send out the colored cabs for the colored players. So they all go uh, back into town. Now Ernie Ladd, who's six foot nine, Earl Faison, who's six foot four, about three hundred pounds, uh, Dick Westmoreland, who's about 6'2", 230 pounds. They're going down Bourbon Street, and they're just walking. And then they hear James Brown, and it's blasting out of the Playboy Club. So they figure, let's go inside. If they're playing Soul Brother Number One, James Brown, it must be a good place. And besides, it's a Playboy Club. <laughs> so they get there, and uh, the bouncer is about, uh, from what I was told, about five foot seven, five foot eight, and these monsters are walking in, six eleven, six five, you know, whatever. And the guy says, I, "I wouldn't go in if I were you." Ernie Ladd looks at him, rips the door off the hinges, yeah. <laughs> rips the door off the hinges. I said, "I'm telling you, I wouldn't go in." And then the guy puts a gun out. And those guys. Uh, the guy all of a sudden got a lot of courage, an awful lot of courage, once he pulled the gun out. So anyway, um, so these guys are walking down Bourbon Street, they're being spit at, uh, they're being cursed at, and they get back to the hotel. And they decide, uh, there were two groups, they decide, well, you know what, let's talk about this. It's so my buddy Abner Haynes. Uh, about seven years ago, Abner Haynes said, hey, let's write a book together. I said, I don't have time. He said, no, you have time. I said, no, I don't have time. Abner Haynes is uh, part Native American, part black. He was the first, uh, as he called it, colored player ever to play football in Texas on a regular basis starting in 1956. And he had a lot of stories. I just didn't have time to, to do the stories. I said, and besides, I never wrote a book like that. So I said, you know what? You need to get a real writer to do whatever you're going to do. But he did have the stories. Uh, so he and David Grayson eventually get a cab. And they go to the uh, Hotel Roosevelt. And they check in. There's no problems checking in. 
and then they go to the elevator, walk over to the elevator. Remember the old elevators with the gate and the hand yeah. crank and all that? It says there's a white woman who's uh, sitting there and she's operating the uh, elevator. And uh, she looks up and she says, what are you monkeys doing here? This is Abner. Uh, they had a woman operating the elevator and she said, you monkeys come in and get to the back. Finally, we had about 10 or 12 guys in my room. We were talking seriously. We're going to stay together. This was just another test. Remember the test? Civil rights movement in the South. These guys do not get any assistance from Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Martin Luther King, or any of the other civil rights leaders of the time, John Lewis among them, uh, uh, NAACP. These guys are on their own, absolutely on their own, and they're not telling anybody about it. Uh, we had no leverage. We weren't playing for money, but we were playing for progress. Football players took the lead, and in a sense they did, although Elgin Baylor, who played with the Minneapolis Lakers back in 1959, sat out of the game in Charleston, West Virginia, when anybody threw a court and offered NBA owners money, that's where they went to play. Charleston was a segregated city. He was segregated. So I'm not playing. I'm not playing. So that was the first protest. Walter Beach was the second, then Bill Russell and others uh, after that in Louisville, Kentucky. Places like Atlanta, New Orleans, and Miami were death holes. Dave Grayson couldn't get a drink at the bar. Our white teammates in New Orleans were there for us, including this guy, Jack Kemp. This is a picture from May 1979 uh, up in Spark Hill, New York at the Rockland uh, Country Club when Jack was running for president. And um, I have stories about that, but I'll, I'll make it simple here. Um, I give him this picture years later, and he looks at it, and he said, what happened to your hair? <laughs> and I said, what happened to your wig? It's powder white. <laughs> and there he is with my son in 2003 with his powdered white wig. Uh, Haynes, one of the things we, the AFL, needed for the unity of... Uh, of the white and black players for a new league. When the white players, uh, Jack Kemp and Jerry Mays, our Kansas City defensive leader, and four or five other guys heard about what was happening, their character showed, and my teammates were looking after me. I met Ron Mix in 1997 and, um, in a hotel in uh, San Diego. When I was out there, I was doing some work. And uh, we kept in touch over the years, and he's still an active lawyer. How old is he? He's about 85, 86 now. And uh, anyway, uh, 2014, when the NBA was having problems with Donald Sterling, the Los Angeles Clippers owner, who had his mistress around and told her not to have any black guys around, whatever, and the players decided they were going to boycott, well, I wanted to get somebody who was part of a boycott, and that was Ron Mix. I said, hey, Ron, you know, I need you for a few minutes. What do you need me for? I said, I need you for 65, comparing it to what's going on in L.A. This is Ron Mix. We were aware that New Orleans was hosting the game to demonstrate to the American Football League and National Football League they, New Orleans, could support the football franchise. The last thing we wanted to do was assist them in demonstrating they could support a franchise. A boycott was the only alternative for the players, and they left. Now Dave Dixon was the promoter, and Dave Dixon, who founded the United States Football League in 1982, was absolutely irate. He was beyond irate. Uh, he told the New York Times, the boycotters had unjustly sullied New Orleans' reputation uh, complaining their militant action would not only damage the city, but would greatly retard efforts by men of goodwill of both races to achieve harmony. I guess, you know, that little thing in the Playboy Club, eh, no big deal. No big deal. Victor Shiro uh, was the mayor. I hope I pronounced it right. That guy had me practice it yesterday because I said I was going to do it today from New Orleans. But he's not here, so he'll never know. Anyway, uh, he said the black players should just roll with the punches. Yeah, with the guns, the insults, not getting the caps, all that other stuff. Yeah, why not? And the governor, John McKeithen, said there are some clubs down on Bourbon Street that won't even let our district attorney, Jim Garrison, in. Garrison was the one behind all the conspiracy theories, by the way, with Lee Harvey Oswald. So there might have been something to that. 
Uh, the game was moved to Houston. Abner said Houston was no day at the beach either, but he said we knew how, where to go in Houston without getting into any problems. New Orleans was on the outside looking in. Eventually, New Orleans would become a political pawn. The Super Bowl would rise out of the ashes of the New Orleans boycott. The American Football League, National Football League, announced the merger plan on June 8, 1966, but the two entities could not get married without the blessing of the parents. And the parents, in this case, the House of Representatives and the United States Senate. This is the commissioner, Pete Rozelle. I'm there with the tie in the background. Somebody must have said something funny because we're kind of laughing. Uh, during the USFL-NFL trial 1986, that's Fortune magazine. And um, I, I got to say this about Pete. For whatever reason, Pete actually talked to me about the mechanics of running a professional sports league. I have no idea why he did, but he did, as did David Stern, we used to hang out at the deli here every Friday, somewhere around here, yeah. whatever deli was around here, after he retired, before he passed away a few years ago. And David taught me a lot. Uh, Roselle became the NFL commissioner in 1960. And the National Football League, doesn't matter what sport you're running, whatever the commissioner is, or whoever that is, he or she is a hardened political lobbyist and the NFL commissioner, Pete Rozelle, was an old hand on Capitol Hill by the summer of 1966. Mainly because of this guy, the Brooklyn Congressman Emanuel Seller, who I think was elected during the War of 1812? No. <laughs> 1922. I, I do know it's 1922. So he had been around forever by this point, 44 years. But in 1961, Rozelle uh, had to lobby. Emanuel Seller, the Brooklyn Democrat, in an attempt to win a limited antitrust exemption so that the National Football League could sell the league's 14 teams as one to either CBS or NBC. Those were the only two networks. ABC was considered a syndicated network. They did a lot of um, Warner Brothers shows, and they also did the Flintstones uh, back in 1960 and, uh, and also the wide world of sports. Sports Broadcast Act of 1961 signed into law by the President John Kennedy September 30th, and that gave the NFL the ability to bundle their teams together and sell them as one and get a bidding war between CBS and NBC, and CBS won the bidding war. That is the day that the modern National Football League goes into existence, unofficially, but that is the day where the that sets the stage for what you see today. That is uh, Russell Long. He was the fifth most powerful Democrat in the Senate in 1966 when the Democrats held the Senate, and he's with Lyndon Johnson. And Pete Rozelle's got to go. Mr. Rozelle goes to Washington, and he's got two people he wants to talk to specifically. One is Russell Long, the other is Hale Box. Because if Long says, I'm not voting for this, well, he's not going to get the votes in the Deep South from the Senate, and if Bob says, I'm not voting for this, he's not going to get the votes he needs from the Deep South because Bob's was powerful in the House. So um, Roselle says to Long, who's the Senate Majority Whip, Chairman of the Financial Committee, we need a merger. And both Long and Bob say to him, well, yeah, I guess you need a merger, but... Uh, what does this do for us? We have no team in New Orleans. And Roselle says, well, you know, we got 24 teams right now. We got 15, they got nine, and there's not enough talent for more than 24 teams. And so um, Long and Bach say, yeah, we sympathize with you. No can do. So Roselle's got to go back to the NFL owners and they got to figure out a way to get the votes. Well, the easiest way to get the votes is just to expand, but they don't want to expand. So they come up with another plan. The Jets are at Chase Stadium at that point. Sonny Werblin is the owner, and Joe Namath is the quarterback. Sonny Werblin worked at MCA. That was Lou Wasserman's company, for anybody of you who have ever been in broadcasting. Casey Wasserman, his grandson, is bringing the uh, Olympics to Los Angeles in 2028. 
Um, Lou Wasserman, MCA, I think Leave It to Beaver was an MCA program. Uh -huh. uh, and Sonny worked for them. He was a talent agent. He also happened to represent Johnny Carson and was Elizabeth Taylor's PR person. He's well connected. Put him out in Hollywood. Move the Jets out there. Move the Jets there. And they have Joe Namath. Joe wants to be an actor. Joe's good looking. He's charismatic. He'll fit in there. Well, this was the thought. We'll move the Jets out to Los Angeles. Daniel Reeves will put his team, the Rams, down in San Diego. You got Baron Hilton in San Diego, but he's got all kind of business interests in New Orleans. We can move the San Diego team to New Orleans. That satisfies everybody. And you know, the Raiders will get them out of the San Francisco Bay Area. They can go to Seattle or Portland. We don't care as long as we're out. Well, sounds good. Till Roselle goes to see his old buddy, Emmanuel Seller, and says, Hey, Manning, you know, look, this is what we want to do. <laughs> Emmanuel Seller, no, 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 no. Well, why? I'm in Brooklyn. My district abuts Queens. How many of my constituents go to Shea Stadium either by driving or take the 7 train there? Mm -hmm. Oh, so what does that mean? <laughs> it means, you want me to approve this? Uh, Jets no. stay in Queens. <laughs> and so everything blows up. Finally, Roselle goes back to his owners, and that's from the Mardi Gras 2019. One of the guys dressed as a blind referee because they thought 2019, some fans that the, the local Saints didn't go to the Super Bowl because right. of a bad call. Right. And so these guys dressed up as referees wearing uh, glasses, carrying canes, uh -huh. saying that they're blind. Uh -huh. Anyway, that was at least on one of those floats. So Roselle and the NFL owners were elected, and they work out a deal with Hale Boggs that include placing a team in New Orleans, and of course, anything the NFL does comes with money. Congress approved the NFL-AFL merger by giving the two competitors an antitrust exemption, which was added as a rider to an anti-inflation tax bill on October 21st, 1966, passed nearly unanimously because what congressman, what congresswoman, no women senators at that time, were, was going to vote for inflation. Yeah, we're in charge. We love inflation. That wasn't going to happen. Got to read you this letter from a grateful owner from the Detroit Lions, Henry Ford's son, William Clay Ford. He sends it to the Honorable Gerald R. Ford, Jr., House of Representatives, Washington, D.C., no zip code, uh, October 26, 1966. Dear Mr. Ford, not Congressman Ford, Mr. Ford. A sincere thank you for your able assistance in bringing about congressional approval of the NFL-AFL merger. The passage of this bill will now allow merger plans to go ahead at full speed. Important also is that the first championship game between the two leagues, leagues capitalized, uh, will now be played for real in January. This is the guy who runs forward, and he says this game is going to be played for real. Think of that. Uh, on behalf of our club, Capital, we thank you for your uh, wholehearted support. Sincerely, William Clay Ford, owner of the Detroit Lions. And uh, so, there it is. Act of Congress makes the Super Bowl. There it is. There's Hale Bods. The NFL awarded the 16th franchise to New Orleans on November 1st, 1966. They were supposed to do it within 10 days, but it came out to Halloween. And they figured, now we won't give it to Halloween because November 1st is All Saints Day. When the Saints come marching in, and that's when they came in. Johnson signs the bill into law on November 8th. 1966. That is the pen that was used uh, for Public Law 89-820, uh, the Suspension of Credit Act, which uh, carried a uh, rider. I got to look on the other side so I can read it um, better to you uh, or get closer. Which carried a rider approving the merger of the National Football League and the American Football League. This pen 
uh, used by the President of the United States in the formal signing of the above-mentioned public law on November 8, 1966, was presented to Pete Rozelle, Commissioner of the National Football League, by Congressman Bates, Bolin, and Tip O'Neill of Massachusetts. With that pen, the Super Bowl is created. Now you know the rest of the story. Now you know it. It's all about money. Now, I wrote a book on the NFL, and it's called uh, Coal Miners, From a Coal Miners Game to Big Business. Initially, somebody talked me out of the title, which I wanted was Cash on the Barrelhead, because that's what the NFL is all about. NFL pocketed $8 million in an expansion fee from uh, the New Orleans uh, owner, John Beacom, uh, and that was split between 15 owners. So that's about $475,000 per owner for doing nothing. Wellington Mara, the owner of the New York Giants, gets $10 million from Sonny Werblin and Leon Hess and Phil Island because the Jets or the Titans invaded the New York territory. Oakland gives $8 million to the San Francisco 49ers owners because they invaded the San Francisco Bay Area. So the Giants come ahead with about $10.4 million doing absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Just goes into their pocket. Now the AFL decides to expand for 1968 and they don't keep the $7.5 million expansion fee. Uh, that goes to the NFL. Another $450,000. So Wellington Mara, now think of $11 million in 1966. That was a ton of money. Wellington Mara and the Giants do nothing and they get $11 million. It's all about money. By the way, here's a trivia question. Did Vince Lombardi ever win a Super Bowl? Yes or no? No. No, because the Super Bowl... It wasn't called. No. It wasn't called. He never won the Super Bowl. It was called the championship game. Green Bay and Kansas City played uh, the first American Football League, National Football League World Championship game on January 15, 1967. The Green Bay coach, Vince Lombardi, wanted to go hunting. He won the NFL championship. And he talked about the AFL as a Mickey Mouse league. How many of you grew up with Mickey Mouse? Do you know how much that rodent is worth? $66 billion the last time Disney tried to sell or was Comcast tried to take over, hostile takeover about 20 years ago. So how many billions of dollars? You know, it is the house the mouse built. So I never understood, I never understood for the life of me when somebody says, oh, that's a Mickey Mouse thing. That's a, what's a Mickey Mouse thing? It's worth something. By the way, you could use the Steamboat Willie version of Mickey Mouse all for your own. The copyright ended on January 1st, 2024 from 1928. Lots of empty seats in the Los Angeles Coliseum that day. Um, the ticket prices were 12, 10, and 6 bucks. Then, even with inflation, say six bucks, you can't get near the stadium in Las Vegas. You couldn't get near it at all. Game is played in the 94,000 seat Los Angeles Coliseum. The ticket price is 12, 10, six bucks, 33,000 empty seats. The last time a Super Bowl or World Championship game was not a sellout. So, how many of you remember Ed Sullivan or Lucy? or Arnold the Pig on Green Acres, uh, or Petticoat Junction, <laughs> or Red Skelton, uh, or Mr. Ed. Well, Lombardi is playing for the pride of Walter Cronkite. He is playing for the pride of Mr. Ed. CBS against NBC. First game was played just 26 days <laughs> after the final approval of the merger between the two leagues. CBS and NBC televised it, same television feed, different announcers, and uh, Bill Paley, the uh, chairman of the board of CBS, leaned on Vince Lombardi. He's coaching for CBS's pride. Uh, unfortunately, the networks didn't take this historic game all that seriously. They wiped out the tape afterwards. It's gone. No complete copies have surfaced over the last 57 years. About 10 years ago, the NFL put out a $10 million award. If you have the game, no questions asked, just give it to us. Well, they were hoping that somebody, whether it was Vietnam, Germany, South Korea, wherever there was a military base that got tapes of this game, 
afterwards, because there was really no satellite in those days, uh, would have just stuck it in their duffel bag and brought it home. Nobody did, apparently, because if they did, they'd have it. There is no complete copy of the game. There are pieces that have been put together, but there is no complete copy. Uh, how many of you remember Frank Gifford? Mm -hmm. Frank Gifford. It's Vince Lombardi's favorite player. And I was doing a talk years ago up in Fairfield County, and the Giants used to uh, train in Fairfield County, and there was a woman like 70 years old or so, and she said, he was such a bad boy. I said, what? He was such a bad boy. So how do you know? I went to Fairfield University. You're going to tell me more? I will. I said, you better not. We have a crowd here. Anyway, so Lombardi's favorite player was Frank Gifford. So in 1988, I did an uh, interview with Jerry Kramer, who was part of the Green Bay Packers offensive line, and he said, I was talking to Frank Gifford years ago, and he mentioned he announced the first Super Bowl. Gifford said he was fairly cool, fairly calm and relaxed. He went over to put his arm on Vince's shoulder, and Lombardi was shaking like a leaf. Gifford said, that really made me nervous. And, you know, Lombardi is playing for the pride of Frank Gifford, too. He was the CBS announcer, and he represented the NFL. Meanwhile, David Sarnoff's NBC. Uh, this year, commercials are going about $7 million for 30 seconds. That year, $42,000 for 30 seconds. Two leagues paid $9.5 million to televise the game. Today, the NFL gets billions of dollars per year for their games. In fact, for one game uh, on Peacock, the NBC streaming network, they got $110 million for the Kansas City-Miami playoff game this year. Uh, NBC want, was hoping that uh, people would buy the game and then buy the service. Uh, when Green Bay was on offense, they used the Wilson Duke football. The Duke, the Duke of Wellington. Named after Wellington Marrow, whose nickname was the Duke, the Giants owner. Uh, when Kansas City had, by the way, how many of you are from New York? New York City area? You're not from New York? Where are you from? Montreal. Oh, Montreal. Oh, you wouldn't know about this. You're going to learn something now. How many of you played with that little pink ball called Spalding? <laughs> Did anybody ever, ever call it by its real name, Spalding? No. Who played stoop ball? Yeah. Played stoop ball. Two or three sewers. Stick ball. Hand ball. These were all the games we played when we were a kid with this little pink ball. It's a little pink ball, right? And we called it the Spalding. It wasn't Spalding. It was Spalding. Anyway, Kansas City, when they had the ball, they used the AFL sanctioned Spalding J5V. Uh, it was Ford against Chrysler, Ford, the uh, NFL sponsor, Chrysler, the AFL sponsor, CBS, the NFL Network against N NBC, the AFL Network, NFL establishment sports writers like Tex Mall, who never met an NF AFL player he liked against the NBC announcer, Kirk Gowdy. They almost got to a fight one day, a uh, fist fight. It wasn't just a game. That all would subside as the, can I mention the Dallas Cowboys in here without getting thrown out? <laughs> How many Giants fans are here? You, you, you accept the fact that I could talk about that. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. No Stephen A here. <laughs> don't get, don't get me started with that. <laughs> anyway, uh, the Dallas Cowboys president, Tex Schramm. Tex Schramm was a guy that if you shook hands with him, you had to count all five fingers to make sure they were still there after you spoke with him. He said to me one day, Super Bowl kind of put the icing on the cake and the interest in the National Football League kept rolling until it was the most popular spectator sport in the United States. Not true. NFL uh, passed, or football passed, surpassed baseball in 1965 in the Harris Poll as the most popular sport in America. That is the uh, Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum where the first game was played. Now, the Super Bowl name. Al Davis began calling the AFL-NFL World Championship game the Super Bowl in 1968 when his Raiders played Green Bay. He's the only one who referred to it as that. No one could think of a proper name. The uh, NFL commissioner, Pete Rozelle, and I were talking one day, and he says, you know, the Kansas City owner, uh, Lamar Hunt, who founded the league, AFL 1968, he said, I thought it was corny. I said, corny? 
I said, I haven't heard that since I'm a kid. You must have been born in 1926, like Razzle Dazzle and all that. I said, yeah, how do you know all that? I said, I read. Anyway, so Roselle didn't think much of the, uh, the name. Uh, on, uh, in, a July tw in a July 25th, 1966 letter to the NFL commissioner, Hunt wrote, I have kiddingly called it the Super Bowl, which obviously can be improved upon. What do you think? Could that be improved upon? No. Do you know where he got the inspiration for oh, the, the Super name? Bowl? The ball, the Super yeah. Bowl. Right. It was one yeah. of the spur of the moment things. No one ever said yeah, what we're going to call it. It was one of those mm -hmm. things that came out of the mouth. Not too inspired. Or was it? <laughs> Hunt was home one day watching his children play with a ball when he first uttered the words. They each had a Super Bowl that my wife had given to them. <laughs> And they were always talking about them, and I used the expression Super Bowl, and it was an accidental thing. I had a blue one. I had a blue one. How many of you had the Super Bowl? Yeah, you had the Super Just threw it. It's hard to explain to kids today what the Super Bowl was. That you threw it against the wall, it bounced crazy, you chased it. It's like, huh? Huh? That's what it was, Super Bowl. Uh, what happened to the Whammo Super Bowl? Well, its shelf life was considerably less than the Super Bowl. The toy made of Zectron. The chemical engineer, Norman Stingley, found that when formed at 50,000 pounds of pressure, Zectron becomes uncontrollably bouncy. Whammo began producing a ball made of Zectron in 1964. I was born in 1956. So I was watching those commercials when I was 8, 9, 10 years old on things like the Soupy Sales Show. How many of you remember Soupy Sales? Just a few of you. Well, you weren't in Montreal. But uh, just a few. I mean, Soupy Sales came up with nuggets like this. Uh, my uh, girlfriend does not know how to make my apple pie, but she knows how to make my banana cream. Oh. And the adults would, ah, and the kids would like, what do you mean by that? And he asked the kids to send them, send the money from San Juan, and I'll send you, I'll send you a postcard. Yeah, I'll tell you that's another day. I'll tell you that story because Sonny Fox told me the whole story. I was with so remember Sonny Fox? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he um, he told me the whole whole story about ten years ago. He died of AIDS. Uh, not AIDS of uh, COVID. COVID-19. Um, he was 95 when he died in 2002. Um, only a few years out, I watched the commercials. The commercials on Soupy Sales, Sonny Fox, Sandy Becker, um, Joe Bolton and the Three Stooges, and Jack McCarthy. That's, that's, that was all my watching back in those days. And he used to have the Super Bowl commercials. Double top secret, Zectron. But everybody knew it was Zectron and um, by the time other companies put it out, and the Super Bowl was gone by 1976. Oops. You cannot, in supermarket ads, use the name Super Bowl unless it's an NFL officially licensed product. Go to the supermarkets, and you will see that right now. The NFL tried to uh, trademark the big game as well, and they said you can't do that. Uh, Hunt said the NFL almost forgot to trademark the Super Bowl name. Only official NFL Super Bowl sponsors can use the Super Bowl name or trademark. The NFL cracks down on entities who do not have permission to use the Super Bowl names, logos, and intellectual property. Joe Namath, me, my friend Bruce Morton, Wingfoot Golf Course, right down the road from here, 1988. 20th anniversary of Namath and the Jets winning the Super Bowl. But uh, there is a story. Now, people remember that Joe guaranteed the victory. But people do not know about Lou Michaels, who is probably the biggest loser in Super Bowl history. And it was Lou Michaels and Joe Namath that crossed paths on January 5th, 1968, at a bar in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, this is what Lou Michaels remembered when I spoke to him. I must say that Joe was a very cocky individual. I never expected that from Joe. When he walked into the place, he had a fur coat on. I'll never forget it, a fur coat in Miami. Now, Joe and Jim Hudson were Jets teammates walk into the bar and they see Lou Michaels, who's a spinning image 
of Walt Michaels, who was the Jets' defensive coach. They were brothers. So Namath walks out and then walks back in. This is what he does. And he points over to me, and instead of saying, hi, I'm Joe Namath, I thought he was going to introduce himself and say hello, he pointed to me and says, we're going to kick the out of you, and I'm going to do it. This is my favorite Super Bowl picture of all time. This is my favorite. It may not be yours, you may not be familiar with it, but this is my favorite Super Bowl picture of all time. Joe Namath on the beach in Fort Lauderdale with the New York media crew and these two women. These two women. And I can just picture this conversation with these two women. Gertie, you think we should go over there and see what's going on? I think that's him. Oh, uh, I don't know, Sadie. You know, let's go over there. Let's go. Let's at And look at Namath's expression. Uh, these women are saying, is that you? And he's saying, yes, it is. Oh, what would the girls of the Bronx say? Oh, the Marsha, we got to tell them, anybody have a camera? Nobody has a camera. Well, they didn't have to tell the girls. The next day they saw it on, on the, in the New York Daily News and the New York Post and, and the New York Times. So can you imagine these two women? I could just picture these two women going back uh, after their winter sojourn in the South. Well, what was he like? He was really nice. And can you imagine the quarterbacks of the any team going to the Super Bowl just hanging out on the beach in a chaise lounge with a team-issued towel? That is my favorite all-time Super Bowl picture. That is it. That is it. Uh, the Jets... Colts game becomes a turning point despite being a 17 and a half point underdog and Green Bay winning the first two games. Namath guarantees the Jets will win and delivers. And more importantly, because of Namath, name changed to Super Bowl three. The Super Bowl takes on a new life. Uh, how many of you watched the game for the halftime show now? Okay, show me. How many of you watched for the national anthem? The pregame show. How many of you watched for the commercials? You watch for the, you write the commercials. Okay, this is the game in 1969. Nobody's rating commercials. There's a flimsy pregame show featuring a marching band. The Apollo 8 astronauts, Frank Borman, Bill Anders, and Tom Hanks. I mean, Jim Lovell. Uh, remember Jim Lovell was played by Tom Hanks in Apollo 13? I, and Jim Lovell played an older astronaut talking to Jim Lovell, who's Tom Hanks in the movie. Anyway, they circled the moon two weeks earlier, and they lead the crowd in the Pledge of Allegiance. The national anthem performed by a trumpet player by the name of Lloyd Geisler, the Florida A&M University marching band, performed the halftime show. Oh, back to Lou Michaels. Okay, Lou gets insulted by Joe. His team loses the game. But there is one more ultimate insult that's coming Lou Michaels' way. So he's got that barroom encounter, the team loses the game, and he makes a bet with his brother, Walt Michaels, a defensive coordinator with the Jets. And he says, this is it. Uh, it's a base salary of $8,000, $5,000. Whoever wins the game, you donate the $5,000 to the Padre and Sawyersville at the church. Okay? And they agree. Well, the Jets win. Walt gets back to Sawyersville, puts up all the Jets' memorabilia, Oh, and he forgets to pay the $5,000 to the Padre. Lou pays the $5,000 out of the $8,000 he earned as the loser's share. Lou Michaels is the ultimate Super Bowl loser. Three times, three insults, and he's never talked about anymore. But I did interview him. Anyway, that's the program from Super Bowl Three. Lenny Lyles against, uh, looks like, George Sauer Jr. Uh, now, there's one up there. Uh, on, a show, on a jet show. Uh, oh, it's Don Maynard then. Yeah, yeah that's Don Maynard. So there you go. Uh, who passed away just uh, yeah. a few months ago. Jets victory, arguably the most important in NFL history, put the AFL on par with the NFL. Uh, the NFL had a hot property. The Super Bowl would go on to become a quasi-national holiday and the most watched TV event of the year. And there's Joe going into the locker room. January 5th is the key date here. This is the showdown that led Namath for the guarantee, and it would turn the Super Bowl into a national obsession. And there is the uh, 2023 NFL uh, Super Bowl MVP, Patrick Mahomes. 
Lombardi never won a Lombardi trophy. He goes to Washington, he dies in 1970, and in 1971 they renamed the trophy. Now, what you might not know about uh, Lombardi, um, I'm in a book called, uh, uh, somebody wrote a book, Royce Broyles wrote a book called Lombardi's Left Side, Dave Robinson and Herb Adderley. And um, Royce asked me if he could use some interviews I did with Adderley, so it's in the book. So I read about the book. And what you might not know about Lombardi, he was a civil rights pioneer. By 1967, they had 13 black players on the team, including the All-Pros, Willie Davis, Willie Wood, Dave Robinson, Herb Adderley, Bob Jeter. He supported the gay players on his team. His brother, Tom who was a priest, was gay, and he also supported Lionel Aldridge's marriage to a white woman. The NFL wanted to suspend Lionel Aldridge for marrying a white woman. Uh, Pete Rozelle said, you got to get him off the team, and Lombardi just, that was that. Okay, how many of you have been on the Queen Mary? Well, I was on the Queen Mary because I was speaking on that cruise ship behind there, so I took a tour of the Queen Mary. The Queen Mary is where the NFL parties start. Uh, Super Bowl takes on the new personality of Super Bowl Seven. My friend Shelly Saltman, who's beyond us now, but try, probably trying to contact me saying, my ears are burning. He was beaten up by Evil Knievel, told me all about this party. He said, Dean Martin was there. These, the Hollywood A-list was there. And people heard about, hey, they have a party. Why can't we have a party in our house? And that's where the party starts. I worked with that guy in the middle for 15 years. Hey, what you doing? Boom! Madden. Uh, I worked for John for 15 years, and I got lots of stories. That's Sink Sound in Manhattan on 10th Avenue and 58th Street. Uh, I'm not going to tell you all the stories, because we'd be here for the next two, three, four days. But, hey, going to have a party? You need your dip? Uh, you need your, you, you got your dogs there, you got your chips there, uh, you got your wings there, uh, no rye bread. Oh, wait a minute. But you got ketchup and mustard, but you have no rye bread, so Madden can't eat because his favorite sandwich was ketchup and mustard on rye bread. Oh, oh, wow. I spent 15 years with the guy. I was on his bus. I knew oh. Willie intimately, the bus driver. Anyway, every community in America is touched somehow by the Super Bowl. Uh, the stores selling big screen TVs, uh, supermarkets having super sales, you can do that. Lori Levy, who worked for the Beer Institute, pointed out uh, just how big the Super Bowl party is. Uh, second biggest food consumption day of the year behind Thanksgiving. There's your big screen TV. According to the National Electronics Dealers Association, sales of large screen TVs in Greece 500% during the Super Bowl week because the event increases the demand for television sets to watch the big game, and for the next month and a half, none are sold. Beer here, beer here. Uh, the Beer Institute actually exists, a Washington, D.C. lobbying group that has data suggesting Super Bowl is one of the seven biggest mm -hmm. sales days of the year behind Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's Eve, 4th of July. Uh, depending on the year, it could be two could be three. Um, and uh, the economic winners, pizza places among others, newspapers, whatever is left in them, do have uh, some uh, advertising uh, for Super Bowl sections. Uh, Super Bowl is a money maker for uh, pizza places, supermarkets, department stores, bars, snack food uh, uh, makers, breweries, restaurants. It's also the springboard for the annual campaign uh, for print and television for commercials. The actual game may take second place as a news event as the NFL attempts to uh, draw non-football fans to the uh, TV uh, rating commercials like you do. And it becomes a major part of the entertainment package. Last year, companies paid $7 million for a 30-second spot. Many years ago, uh, I was called down to Smith & Walensky's. Got to go cover something. I said, what? you got to cover football commercials. The Coca-Cola ad down in the old stadium in Mount Vernon still remains the number one football-related commercial of all time, even though it was done in 1979. Joe became a big star. 
pantyhose was never advertised in uh, the Super Bowl. A couple of women over the years said, why are you just showing that part? You're not showing the pantyhose. Can we see more? I said, well, what do you want to see? We want to see more. So I show them more. There you go. And I show them this. Uh, Medicaid coverage helpline. I'm happy I called. Some of the best commercials uh, of all time. Uh, mean Joe Green, the Coke, Apple. The only time Apple ever, ever had a commercial on TV. Super Bowl 1994 sledgehammer. 96, Pepsi, Coke guy takes Pepsi. Tabasco sauce, 88, uh, 89 rather. Doritos, 3D Doritos, 98. Uh, Clydesdales are coming back this year, 2003, Budweiser. Reebok, uh, Terry Tate off a of slidebacker, and the one with Betty White and Abe Vigoda, the Snickers commercial where Betty White's plowed into yeah. when she was 88 years old. <laughs> okay, there is a hangover. There is a hangover from the game. People get hammered, lose money, <laughs> eat too much, not feel good. So on February 2023, 20, two Tennessee lawmakers, Representative Joe Towns Jr. and Senator London Lamar of Memphis introduced legislation to make the day after the Super Bowl a state holiday replacing Columbus Day. In 2020, workforce institutes at Cronus claim estimated 17.5 million U.S. employees say they may not go to work Monday after the Super Bowl, and 40% think that uh, the Super Bowl should be a national holiday. <laughs> now, the easy way to fix this, very easy, move the game back a week, and it coincides with <laughs> President's <laughs> Week. Now, the NFL is major, major, major political influences in the Arizona problem, 1988. Uh, that is Ronald Reagan, and uh, with him is Coretta Scott King, and it's November 2nd, 1983, when Reagan signs into law the bill creating the uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day, civil rights leader who was uh, assassinated in 1968. Uh, the holiday is observed for the first time on January 20th, 1986. The politics of the Super Bowl. And uh, there uh, are members of the uh, Arizona, or actually it's the Phoenix Cardinals at that point. Bill Bidwell was the owner of the uh, St. Louis Cardinals, and he moves the uh, team out to uh, Tempe in 1988. And he screws up the market, and they're not selling tickets. So the NFL owners said, we're going to help Brother Bill, and we're going to give him a Super Bowl, and maybe he'll get more people to buy tickets, and they may be able to buy tickets to the Super Bowl when they're around. Uh, in 1986, the governor, Bruce Babbitt, issued an executive order creating a paid MLK holiday. But the next year, the new governor, Ever Meacham, canceled the holiday. Bidwell took the St. Louis team to Tempe in 1988. And there is Martin Luther King. And as soon as the holiday is rescinded, Stevie Wonder said, I ain't coming. I'm not playing Arizona. Convention planner said, we're not coming. The battle was on. In 1989, the Arizona State Legislature passed legislation to create a state holiday honoring King, but opponents managed to get enough signatures on the petition to get the votes uh, in, get voters in the state to decide on whether or not to honor King in November 1990. Well, the Arizona voters uh, basically out uh, tur overturned the uh, legislature's decision. The NFL pulled the Super Bowl from Tempe, moved it to the Rose Bowl in Pasadena. The NFL said, we'll give you a do-over. 1992 presidential election, you say yes, we'll give you the next big game. Voters said yes, the big game went to Tempe in 1996, and uh, it's part of the rotation of Phoenix market. Well, uh, how many of you remember this anthem, Whitney Houston? Live or on tape? How many say live? How many say tape? Jim Steig, old friend of mine, Jim Steig, uh, with the NFL. Early January 1991, our coordinator of Super Bowl pregame activities, Bob Best, produced a recording of the Florida Orchestra for National Anthem producer, Ricky Minor. A week later, Minor flew to Los Angeles to have Whitney record the vocal track. Done in one take. Halftime, money, 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 money. 
But if you're a halftime performer, you don't get paid. Yeah. You do not get paid because the exposure is enough, according to the NFL. Halftime performers are not paid to perform. The NFL covers costs related to the production of the halftime show, but the talent does not take home a paycheck. Although the NFL foots the bill for their travel expenses. The trade-off, Super Bowl halftime headliners have a sizable commercial uptick in digital albums and mm -hmm. song sales. Okay, how many of you remember Justin Timberlake and Janet Jackson? <laughs> and how many of you actually saw the deed? Because you did it. You had to be on TiVo or take the game and slow it down, slow it down, and slow it down till you got to that frame. Nine sixteenths of a second. Janet Jackson's costume malfunction at the halftime of the 2004 game caused a ruckus and changed how television and radio present programming. ABC showing of Saving Private Ryan was impacted. How many of you watched Saving Private Ryan? You saw it? Sure. Sure. Did you like it? Yeah. Okay. FCC acts almost immediately. Justin Timberlake grabbed Jackson in a dance routine, accidentally forcing her dress to open, which revealed one of her breasts. Nine sixteenths of a second. That was it. So, it was AOL instant messaging in those days, Yahoo messaging. Did you see what I saw? What did you see? No. You have TiVo. Oh, you do? Can you slow it down and slow it? Ah, there it is! One friend. Politicians derided Viacom CBS, Viacom MTV unit, which produced the halftime show. Within 15 hours, politicians gathered on the steps of the Capitol in Washington, pointing the finger at Jackson, not Timberlake, at Jackson and CBS for promoting something immoral. Uh, the hammer came down on CBS, the Republican Federal Communications Commission, Bush's president, Republican. They have three to two. Biden president now, Democrats have it three to two. Uh, on the FCC commission. Uh, and they find Viacom CBS $550,000, changed in decency rules. Uh, Viacom CBS fought the fines for seven years and, and won. So now that comes up to Saving Private Ryan, which is on about six weeks later. The FCC raised the amount stations and networks could be docked for what could be termed questionable images in dirty words. 2004 television stations, GMs, were scared off. Uh, by the prospects of fines. 66 ABC TV affiliates, mostly in the South, didn't show the movie, Saving Private Ryan on Easter Sunday because of foul language concerns. The TV stations didn't want the risk of fine. Saving Private Ryan had won five Academy Awards following the 1998 release. It had aired on ABC twice in 2001 and 2002. Military veterans groups were furious with the stations and Disney ABC offered to pay the fines of the 66 stations if the FCC decided to dock them. It had been on twice before. FCC got one complaint. They never acted on it. So you need safe acts at the Super Bowl. And the NFL decided to go the safety route, bringing Paul McCartney in, who spent nine days in jail because he was busted for pot in 1980 in Japan. And Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band was recorded with uh, the uh, four Beatles taking an old uh, music uh, additive called the Speedball, alcohol and cocaine. It's been around since the 19-teens. Anyway, so they figured he's a safe act. And the next year, another safe act, Keith Richards with Mick and Ron Wood. Keith Richards, who's taken every drug known to man, allegedly, he's there. And then came The Who, and two of the original members of The Who are dead, drug-related deaths, but they were all safe acts. Uh, Bruce Springsteen and Mariah Carey and Michael Jackson and Madonna and Justin Timberlake twice, Beyonce and Jennifer Lopez and Janet Jackson and McCartney and The Stones and The Who, Whitney Houston, Prince, Lady Gaga, Katie uh, Perry, who once kissed a woman and liked it, and the NFL allowed that song. Rihanna, Dr. Dre, Kendrick Lamar, Eminem, Snoop Dogg, and Mary J. Bly performed halftime uh, at the halftime ceremonies. No longer did the NFL have up with people. So I got a question for you as we wrap this thing up here, and I kept you a few minutes late, but uh, 
Got a question. Is the Super Bowl the ultimate game? Yes or no? Yes, How many say yes, it's the ultimate game? Okay. Dwayne Thomas played with the Dallas Cowboys yes. in the 1971 Super Bowl. And there are all kinds of questions that are asked of all the players all week. And uh, so anyway, Dwayne Thomas, 1971, is the Super Bowl, the ultimate game. Uh, that was asked of uh, Thomas, 1971, and Thomas responded, if the Super Bowl is the ultimate game, how come there's another one next year? That is Marcus Allen, who uh, was the MVP of the Super Bowl back in 1982, and I'm interviewing him, uh, the Sport Magazine uh, MVP, and that was at the Waldorf Astoria. And I'm going to give you one story with John Madden and my wife, 1999. Uh, Madden's nickname was Pinky, but I won't get into that. <laughs> Pinky and Monica. Uh, so we're at the Arizona Biltmore, and uh, the NFL owners meeting, we're at a party, and this is a party hosted by Fox, and um, Rupert Murdoch is there, and he has to leave, and he tells Madden, you're the MC. So Madden pulls me aside, hey, Wiener, you got to help me here. I said, okay, what do, you, what do you need? What do you need? He says, uh, what am I supposed to do? I said, you get paid millions of dollars a year, I get nothing, and you're asking me what to do? Uh -huh. So it's synchronized swimming. There are two women, and it's synchronized swimming at the pool of the Arizona Biltmore. And he said, what do I ask him? I said, I don't know. I don't know. Ask him, you know, ask him how they're doing. So he starts this interview. Oh, uh, you two are swimmers? Yeah. To swim together? Yeah. And you do the same thing? Yeah. And I'm like, John, ask him how long they have to do. This is going on for about 20 minutes. So anyway. Afterwards, uh, Madden takes a picture of my wife, and we figure we're going to hang it up. We'll get it signed. But I'm not going to see him. My producer, Gary Bridges, is going to see him in San Francisco, so I give the picture to Gary. And uh, Gary takes it out to San Francisco, and he says, hey, Wiener's wife wants you to sign this. So puts the picture down. John looks at it. It's Monica Lewinsky. <laughs> now, Swinger's wife. Find your glasses. Who put Monica Lewinsky's face on the Wiener's wife? He didn't believe it was my wife. He thought it was Monica Lewinsky. He said, one day I take a picture with Monica Lewinsky. And my wife was really happy because at that time Monica Lewinsky was about 20 years younger than she was. So anyway, there's Pinky and there's Monica. And if you have any questions and comments, it's your turn to talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no questions? Uh, no comments? Uh, yeah. yeah. You were talking about the biggest losers of the Super Bowl. Yeah. And I heard a story that I forgot. It's, it's I think his name was Timothy something. He was a police commissioner. Yeah. Well, in, uh, in a few cities. But in 1968, he was a New York City uh, pat uh, patrol officer. Yeah. And he was out working like, the day before, I think, the AFL championship game. Okay. And uh, at 3 in the morning, 4 in the morning, he saw Joe Namath coming in drunk. Oh, okay. So he called up his book 